Let's have a look at the map of isotopes. Here we have uranium, thorium and plutonium, which were irradiated with neutrons. This made it possible to advance 18 units starting from uranium. But no further neutron capturing of neutrons took place thereafter, since not even the power of underground explosions was enough to make it happen. Beta decays led to this place, where fermium-248 is located. Then they began using heavy ions. They took heavy targets and light projectiles, leading them to advance to elements 108 and 109. But this was still only halfway to the island of stability. Here is cold fusion, which we stopped pursuing. In this respect, it is, of course, a rather radical action. Lead was used instead of uranium and thorium, and it was irradiated with heavier shells. This resulted in rather large masses and large charges. But this ship is sailing past the island. Neutrons are needed to get to this island, but where to get them from? After all, two nuclei collided, the number of protons and neutrons in them were determined, and the total charge and total mass were determined, but there were not enough neutrons. To reach the island, it is necessary to move to the right. This is, in general, a rather complicated matter, and for about 15 years, it was unclear how to get there. In the end, pessimism set in, along with the belief that maybe this is only a beautiful idea. Somewhere far in the sea, there is an island, beautiful and large with many elements, but no one can sail to it, it is unreachable. In actual fact, it can be reached by making the experiment very difficult, significantly more complicated than it had been up until that point. For this purpose, it would be necessary to start with neutron-rich elements. Starting off, one element would be artificial, the one that is obtained in the reactor as a result of neutron capture. At the time, the reactor had been operating for a whole year, and the very fact that this element was obtained as a result of neutron capture, means that it was neutron-rich. This element won't live long, only as long as is needed for our experiment, with the understanding that there is an excess of neutrons in this element. That is, it immediately raises a huge number of problems related to the reactor, as well as the reactor physics in general. There was lead and there was a lot of it, but now this process must be adapted and recalculated for the use in more powerful reactors. We have powerful enough reactors in Russia in Dmitrovgrad, the SM2 and SM3, and we started the first experiments to produce the aforementioned substance. The second reactor is in Oak Ridge. This is the same large reactor that first made additional plutonium, which was then used to produce the first American atomic bombs. This reactor was later improved on many times. Today, we will see it later, it has a record fluence and an intensity of 2.5 times 10 to the power of 15 neutrons per square centimeter per second. And such a reactor is capable of producing 10 milligrams of substance per year, the kind of substance that we need in order to have a neutron-rich target. As for the bombarding ion, nature has provided us with the perfect gift for this purpose. I cannot say it in any other way. This is again calcium-48. There is also a lot of calcium on Earth, but mostly calcium-40, with 20 protons and 20 neutrons. But among the isotopes of calcium, there is calcium-48, containing 20 protons and 28 neutrons, which is very rare, occurring at only 0.19% worldwide naturally within calcium. It is extremely difficult to obtain it, to extract and enrich it, because, unfortunately, calcium has no gaseous compounds, and therefore gaseous diffusion methods, widely used for isotope separation, are not suitable in this instance. It is obtained via a mass separator, that is, a beam is obtained and in this way it is accumulated. It is very expensive. 
one gram costs $250,000 and it must be accelerated to 0.1% of the speed of light and work for a long time, years in fact, in the hope that calcium-48 and plutonium are obtained. But not plutonium-239, which is used in nuclear power plants, but rather plutonium-244, which has five extra neutrons. Now, if plutonium-244 and calcium-48 merge, then we get element-114 with a large excess of neutrons. And then we will be closer to the island of stability and we will be able to identify any thresholds there and understand whether there is stability there. And this was the main drive for further research because in order to make progress, it was necessary to overcome this obstacle concerning cold fusion. Well, this is one side of the matter, a small part of it. On the other side, there is a complete lack of neutrons. As for the small cross-section, the Coulomb barrier must somehow be reduced, because in cold fusion, an increase in the mass and charge of a particle leads to the fact that the elements do not merge. Then we move on to more asymmetric reactions, such as calcium-48 and a heavier target. Of course, we will reduce the Coulomb repulsion between the interacting nuclei so that they will merge. We are now making plutonium-244 plus calcium-48, where the product of Z sub 1 and Z sub 2 equals 1880. The old method would have had to irradiate lead with germanium-76 and it would have resulted in 2624. That is, switching to this combination reduces the Coulomb energy by 30%. And as for lead and calcium in terms of excess neutrons, it gives 8 additional neutrons, 8 extra neutrons. And as you will see now, these 8 neutrons play a key role in understanding whether there are super heavy elements or not. But first, we need to understand how this combination works.